Hi everyone, I'm Chaloste and I'm the Early Years Policy Lead at the National Children's Bureau and I'm delighted to welcome you to this Foundation Years podcast for PBI settings and childminders focused on the revised Early Years Foundation stage. In this podcast we'll be hearing from the Department for Education Ofsted and Dr Julian Grenier and before we get started on that, as you may know through the Foundation Years channels, NCB has developed a range of resources to support with the implementation of the revised EYFS. Through this, we had feedback that it'd be useful to have a vodcast with all the key messages around the revised EYFS for PBIs and childminders in one place, which is what we have for you here now. Um, if you would like any more detail um, on the topics covered in this vodcast, there is a dedicated page on the Foundation Years website for both the revised EYFS and the updated development matters, which includes an in-depth vodcast on the updated development matters with uh, Dr. Julian Grenier, the Department of Education, and uh, there are some case studies in there as well. We also recently hosted five free Learn, Explore, Debate events focused on implementing the revised EYFS with presentations from the Department of Education, Ofsted, Dr. Julian Grenier, as well as case studies from an earlier setting and an early adopter setting on reducing unnecessary workload, tracking and assessment. Um, we also had an in-depth session on self-regulation in the early years, which included an interview with Dr. Suzanne Ziedike and a case study from an earlier setting as well. And if you're watching this podcast and you're a head teacher or a senior leader, there is a dedicated broadcast for you, which we'll put a link to in the description below, or it's on the Foundation Years website, um, as well as all the other resources I just mentioned. So I'm now delighted to hand over to Anna Jones from the Department of Education. Hi everyone, and thank you for taking the time today to watch this podcast. Uh, my name is Anna Jones and I'm the team leader for Early Years Curriculum and Assessment Policy at the Department for Education. Uh, I'm just going to be spending some time talking to you today about the Early Years Foundation Stage reforms, uh, which as you'll know will be statutory from September 2021, and spend some time talking about what this means for you and your setting. Uh, I'll just start off with a bit of an introduction to this podcast and who it's for. Uh, so it's aimed at PBI nurseries and at childminders, and it's been developed to provide an overview of the EYFS reforms and exactly what is changing from September 2021. It's been developed to explain what the changes mean for earlier settings and to share guidance on what earlier settings should do, both in the run up to September and from September onwards. Uh, so this podcast will provide a high level summary of the changes, but for more detailed information, do advise that you read through the revised EYFS framework um, and the other supporting documents that I'm going to link to throughout the broadcast. Uh, your local authority may also have provided you with some support ahead of statutory rollout or be planning to do this. Uh, so first of all, I just wanted to talk a little bit about why we are making these changes now. Uh, so the reforms to the EYFS have been a number of years in the making. Uh, so it started off with the primary assessment consultation back in 2017, and this was followed by an independently evaluated pilot and a full public consultation on the proposals. Uh, all of the changes were developed through sustained engagement with the earlier sector and with childhood development experts, and they're firmly based on the latest evidence and what's most important for supporting the learning and development of young children. We confirmed the final changes in government's official response to the public consultation, and this was published back in July 2020. Uh, so the first of the key aims of the reforms is to improve outcomes at age five. Uh, we want to focus in particular on closing the gap between disadvantaged children and their peers. We're also aiming to reduce unnecessary workload for early years practitioners. And we think that by removing the unnecessary paperwork and tracking, practitioners can spend more time engaging with children. And we know that that's the most important thing for supporting their learning and development. Obviously, this is crucially important all of the time, but we think it's of particular importance in the current climate where COVID-19 has been adding extra pressure on practitioners and leading to some children spending sustained periods of time away from earlier settings. We have also made one key change to the safeguarding and welfare requirements in the framework. So this is to support good oral health of all children by being explicit that the current requirement to support the good health of children includes oral health. On top of this, we have made a number of minor edits to clarify existing policy in the safeguarding and welfare section. Uh, so this is to clarify areas that we know the sector has highlighted as being potentially quite confusing 
and also just to reflect updates and other pieces of legislation that have taken place since the framework was last updated in 2017. So what has changed? So in a nutshell, we've transformed early ed curriculum and assessment to really focus on what matters the most for children's outcomes. This slide just gives a high level overview of what we've done, um, and I will come back to each one in more detail a little bit later on. So on the early ed curriculum, we've put early language at the heart of a broad and balanced curriculum. So what we've done is strengthened the high level educational programmes that are set out in the EYFS and made sure that there's a much deeper focus throughout those on building vocabulary. To help with this, we've also published a new non-statutory development matters curriculum guidance document. And that document now also has a dedicated section for reception year. And I'll go into that in a bit more detail a little bit later on. Um, so on assessment, we've brought in a new approach to the statutory EYFS profile. So I do know that the majority of people listening to this presentation will not need to assess children against the 17 ELGs. Um, so the profile and assessment against the early learning goals is undertaken for the most part by reception teachers when children reach the end of the EYFS. But I will give an update now just to set the context of the wider reforms. Uh, so we've revised all 17 early learning goals across the seven areas of learning just to make them clearer, more precise, and just to make it easier for practitioners to undertake the assessment. Uh, one of the other key changes we've made is to remove the exceeding criteria. So children will now only be assessed as either emerging or expected um, against expected levels of development. We do hope that this will simplify the assessment and just leave more time for teachers to support all of their children to reach expected levels of development before they move on to year one, as well as giving them just more time to spend identifying and stretching more able pupils with a stretching curriculum. Uh, we've also removed the statutory duty for local authorities to externally moderate teachers EYFSP judgments. So we do know from the EYFS profile pilot evaluation um, that in the absence of external moderation, teachers really found that their workload had reduced and that this really let them focus on teaching an, affecting pra an effective practice rather than gathering lots of physical evidence for the purposes of moderation. So we're really confident that these three changes to the EYFSP assessment will free practitioners up just to use that professional judgment and plan and support children to reach a good level of development. Um, from September 2021, as I mentioned before, the requirement within the EYFS Section 3 to promote the good health of children will explicitly include oral health. So it will be for individual settings to determine how they meet that requirement, and it will very much depend on the circumstances of each setting. And I'll go into that in a bit more detail later on in the presentation. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we have also made a number of minor amendments to the safeguarding and welfare section, but this is just to clarify the wording around existing policies um, or to reflect updates that have been made to legislation since the EYFS was last updated. So I'm now just going to go into slightly more detail on each of the specific changes, which will help with preparation for the reforms, um, just beginning with changes to the educational programmes. So as you all know, the educational programmes are the areas of learning and development that have to shape the activities and experiences that children will have in your earlier setting, and that has to be relevant for all ages. So your setting has to use the educational programmes to decide the approach for curriculum that is right for you and for the children in your setting. So the seven areas of learning and development remain the same. And we've also kept the split between the prime and the specific areas, but we have made changes to the specific wording of the educational programmes. Uh, so this means they're longer, uh, there's a lot more depth and they contain more examples of things that you can do with children in your care. There's also a new focus on early language and extending vocabulary with more examples on how to embed and develop vocabulary skills across all seven areas. Uh, we've really focused on this area just because we know it's such an important predictor of later success um, and it'll be particularly important for closing the word gap between disadvantaged children and their peers. Uh, we've also published, as I mentioned before, the new Development Matters, uh, so that's non-statutory curriculum guidance uh, for the EYFS, and that sits alongside the framework and can help inform your approach to curriculum, putting the educational programmes into practice. So just to go into slightly more detail on Development Matters, 
So this was published in July 2020, and that was to support early adopter schools and nurseries with implementation of the new EYFS from the beginning of this year. If you're not an early adopter school or nursery, you might still find elements of the new development matters useful um, and start incorporating that into your practice this year. Uh, but you do still need to follow the existing framework until the reforms are rolled out on a statutory basis from this September. Uh, so Dr Julian Grenier, who leads the East London Research School and is also the head teacher of Sheringham Nursery School and Children's Centre, led on the work to pull together development matters. And he did that with lots of input from practitioners from across the sector. Uh, so we've really taken the opportunity here to refocus the guidance on curriculum so that it's not used as a tracking document um, towards the early learning goals, uh, which we do know has previously been quite common practice across the EYFS. Uh, it's for this reason that there's no reference to the early learning goals within the new development matters, and that's just to discourage tracking against that document. The guidance sets out the pathways of children's development in broader ages and stages. So the main purpose of that is to help practitioners to assess each child's level of development and to help them check that children are secure in their learning, but rather than focusing on moving from one age band to the next. Um, it really supports practitioners and senior leaders in using their professional knowledge to develop the right curriculum for the children that they're working with. So one of the key objectives of the new development matters is to reduce workload burdens by supporting teachers and practitioners to use that professional judgment rather than gathering lots of evidence and recording progress. It really offers a top level view of how children develop and learn and it guides but doesn't replace professional judgment. Uh, so I mentioned before that we have a lot of early adopter schools this year who have been using the new development matters document alongside the new EYFS requirements and we've received lots of positive feedback from those schools um, which does suggest that the new development matters is really supporting practitioners in using that professional judgment and has been successful in freeing up their time um, so they're not spending lots and lots of time on observations and assessment but are just able to spend a lot more time really interacting with children um, and as you can see on this slide, um, yeah, we've been getting really good feedback from early adopters and some examples of that feedback can be seen here. Uh, so we're now going to hear directly from Dr Julian Grenier on development matters, um, who has some messages that he wants to get across to the sector. What's new in the updated 2021 development matters? I think the first thing to say is that it's a lot briefer than its predecessor. It's about two thirds of the length. It's also written in more accessible language, and that means that you can read it in about an hour and a half. One of the interesting things when we talk to practitioners about the 2012 development matters is very few people had read it from beginning to end and got that big picture. So we'd encourage you to read it. It's 90 minutes, either fine 90 minutes and I know life is busy, or maybe split it down into smaller blocks of time just to get a sense of what the document is saying and what that big picture is. Although it's shorter overall, there's actually more focus on children's early communication. So that section is now longer. Um, we work closely with ICANN, the children's communication charity, to get that right. The reason is that it's increasingly clear that children's thinking, their learning, their social development, all sit on the bedrock of their early communication. We know that how well a child communicates at five is one of the best predictors we've got about how well they'll be doing in school at 11. Yet we also hear from practitioners of significant concerns about children's communication. So there's more focus there. Second, reducing workload. So if I can pick up those DFE themes, it's just making sure we stop and think before we do something. Is this going to be useful? Is this the best thing I can spend my time doing? And again, it was interesting talking to practitioners that for many of us, it wasn't so much the workload. It was more the sense we were putting a lot of effort into things that didn't make a positive difference to children. That was the problem. There's specific guidance for the reception year in the new document which um, was asked for in a DfE consultation on assessment. And number four is a renewed emphasis on narrowing the gap. 
the pedagogy section in the updated development matters is really an evolution from where we were in 2012. It's very similar. So it focuses on the different dimensions of pedagogy or how we help children to learn. So we know that that's partly about the enabling environment, the equipment that we carefully select, the way we store and present that to the children, the way that we make changes in response to children's interests or to bring in new challenge. And um, that is a really significant part of early years pedagogy. In the foreground is what we're doing minute by minute. And that is hugely important. Those moments when we decide to stand back so that we encourage children's independent play and exploration and we don't interfere with it. Those moments when we know it's best to get stuck in and join in with a child's play. The times when we know it's important to offer an adult guided playful learning experience to help the children develop or practice something new. The times when it's important directly to teach children something all the way from say the two year old who really wants to stick something on their collage but isn't sure how to twist the glue stick and get the glue to work to phonics in reception, for example. So those choices are really important. One of the most important things we can do is give time to children, listen to children, have conversations with them. And those back and forth conversations extended over several terms make a really big difference to children's early communication. Yet often we're so busy doing other things that we lose our focus on that cornerstone of effective early years practice. And one of the key benefits that early adopters told us about with the reduced burden on evidence gathering and data collection was that they quite simply had more time to have conversations with children and to play with them. And they noticed that that had a really positive effect on the children's learning and development. So we know that our pedagogy has to be flexible and we have that repertoire of different approaches. Play is central to early learning. There's absolutely no question about that. All the way through the EYFS, we know that play is enjoyable. It's how children develop their thinking and their communication. It's how children make friends with each other, which is such an important part of the early years. Learn to share learn to manage not getting what you want straight away, find ways of compromising. All of these things happen through play and all of that imaginative stuff that provides the basis of so much later thinking happens in its early days in the play that we all support and foster. So play is absolutely central to children's early learning, as also are the characteristics of effective teaching and learning. So we know that when the children come and join us, that they are really powerful learners. Young children are described by the psychologist Alison Gopnik as the most powerful learning machines in the universe. But what we do can help them become even more powerful learners. All that help we offer to children so that they explore materials independently, make their own decisions that encouragement we give so that children bounce back when something goes a bit wrong. All of those things make children more powerful learners and they're all really important. And finally, there has to be a balance between child-led and adult-guided learning. And that's true across the whole of the early years. So if you're working in a baby room or a baby as a childminder, you'll know that the majority of your time, your responding to the baby's care needs, you're responding to the baby's exploration uh, in using all their senses of all of the things around them. And that's absolutely right. But there are points of the day when some of the baby's experience is adult guided. So for example, if you have treasure basket play, you will decide when that's offered to the baby. 
and what you put in the treasure basket for them to explore. You might initiate a game of Pipa. You might decide which rhyme or song it would be really good idea to sing at a particular time. So there's always that balance. But as children get older, there should be more of that adult guided learning. And that's one of the key findings of the EPSI research project. That is particularly important in the reception year. And from the beginning to the end of the reception year, that balance should shift. So we would see more adult guided learning by the end of the reception year than we saw at the beginning. But there is still always, all throughout this phase, an important role for what children choose to do for their independent play and learning, which is so central to the EYFS. What is more different in development matters is the new focus on curriculum. And I think Phil Mins gave us some really good ways into thinking about this. So the, what I mean there by the top level view is what we all need to think about in school early years provision, in settings as childminders, is what are the key things that we want children to experience, to learn, to be able to do whilst they're with us? We know the group of children we're working with better than anyone else. And that gives us a strong insight into the answer to that question, which should say something brief and accessible that all of our teams and parents can understand. So we're not talking about lengthy curriculum progression documents. We're talking about a brief top level view and it will vary from place to place. So here in this corner of East London, lots of our children live in noisy and cramped housing. And that has a negative impact on their language development and on their physical development. So our curriculum strongly focuses on those two aspects. But if I was a few miles further east from here, where on average children have larger houses with gardens, more play opportunities, I would have a different focus. One of the reasons that development matters is shorter is to make more space for all of us to make the professional judgment and decisions about what's right for our children. As I said earlier, we must tackle unnecessary workload. So it is important that the focus on curriculum doesn't create a whole lot of new work and that people are proportionate and sensible about this change. We also know that it's a balanced approach to early years that is most effective. So in other words, large amounts of children's time, quite appropriately, should be spent in their self-chosen play and exploration and activity. But we've got to be balanced about it. We've also got to have that big picture of what we want children to experience, to know, to be able to do so that we're making sure that children aren't missing out on important things during their time with us. That key value around inclusion and making sure that every child can thrive in our early years provision. So Iram Siraj in 2004, I think put this really well. She said that an effective curriculum framework supports practitioners to think clearly about pedagogical aims. What are the key things we want children to know, experience, to be able to do? What are our big aims for every child? It ensures that practitioners are mindful of children's progression and it focuses our attention and observation on the most important aspects of children's development. So when we are taking that important time, to observe children's learning. We are focused on the most important aspects of their development. That means we make the best use of the time we have available. Some of the biggest questions about the updated EYFS and the things that were the biggest struggles for the early adopters were around assessment and tracking. So I'm really just going to give a few of the headlines that those early adopters found useful. 
focus on what's useful. So before you start a schedule of observation and assessment and uploading it onto a tracker and analyzing it, think about what is it that you want to know and need to know? And what would be the most straightforward ways of getting that information? So let's think about establishing children's starting points when they first join a reception class, which was the discussion with the early adopters. But this, I think, would be true across the EYFS. What is it we most need to know? So I would say that what we most need to know are things like the child's confidence to make a new relationship with their key person, to move from parent to key person or parent to childminder, to make relationships with other children, how well the child relative to their age can communicate what they want and what they need. I'd want to know a bit about their small and large motor development. Can they play and take part in lots of the experiences I'm offering with the equipment or are they struggling with that? I would want to know something about their self-help skills too. Dressing, undressing, using the toilet, eating. Why do I want to know those things? Because most of the children, if we've got the provision right, the key person approach right, if we are giving children that stimulating experience every day, most of the children with some ups and downs are going to settle well and they're going to be accessing the learning on offer, the curriculum. But some children won't. They'll be struggling in some of those areas I talked about earlier. So we need to focus a lot of effort to help those children to overcome those early struggles so that as soon as possible, they're making friends, they're taking part, they're engaged in the learning on offer. So that's what I mean by a focus on what's useful, rather than saying, we need this amount of data that's gonna provide evidence of children's starting points and evidence of their progress. Because once we start talking in those terms, we're making assessment and data our central preoccupation, not supporting the children, not helping their learning. We need to have the right tools for the job. So again, for most children, the top level view of our curriculum and looking at how well children are making progress towards the things that we think are important, checking their progress in the prime areas, that's going to be perfectly sufficient. But if a child is struggling with their learning, it may not be sufficient. We might need to use a more detailed assessment system. If a child, for example, is struggling with their early communication, we might need to think about using the DFE funded tool Universally Speaking, which you can download free online, so we can look in more detail at the difficulty they're having. And the EEF's Early Years Measures database, which helps us find the best tools to find out exactly where a child might be struggling with their learning. Where we're observing and assessing children's learning, the children's voices and reflections should be central. So it's much better to do less of that sort of assessment that involve the children in reflecting and talking about their learning and development than to do lots and lots of photos and observations that the children aren't part of and play no role in the children's thinking or development. Because just taking a picture of something a child's done on an iPad and uploading it onto a tracker makes zero difference to a child's learning and experience. Parents too must be included in high quality assessment work. And just to reiterate that message, it's vital that we're inclusive uh, so now just moving on from curriculum to assessment. Um, I'll set out in a bit more detail uh, the specific changes to the early learning goals, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, I do just want to reiterate that the early learning goals are a specific assessment that takes place at the end of reception year, um, and they shouldn't be used as a curriculum or to track against throughout the EYFS. Uh, so pre-reception providers don't need to assess against the early learning goals. 
So as I mentioned earlier, the goals have been revised to make them clearer and more precise. Um, and we have retained all 17 early learning goals to keep the breadth of the current EYFS approach. Um, as with the educational programmes, we've retained the same focus on the prime and specific areas. And that will just really ensure that areas like PSED are given equal focus to areas like mathematics and literacy when we're determining how ready children are for the next stage of education. So the key changes to the ELGs are set out on this slide. Um, so under communication and language, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's much more of a focus on extending children's vocabulary. Uh, the main change to PSUD is a new early learning goal on self-regulation. Um, and the elements of self-care that previously sat under physical development have now moved under PSUD. Physical development is now separated into fine and gross motor skills as two separate early learning goals. And under literacy, there's a new goal on comprehension. Uh, in mathematics, there's a much greater focus on the numbers to 10, and that's really just to ensure a depth of understanding. And shape, space and measure is no longer a specific ELG, but it does remain in the educational programme. So we're really clear that all settings must still cover that in their curriculum. For understanding the world, technology is no longer a separate goal in its own right. And under expressive arts and design, there's a lot more clarity and focus on how developing language can really um, be supported through this area of learning. So this slide goes into a bit more detail on the changes to assessment data and moderation um, that go beyond the changes that we've made to the early learning goals and the early as foundation data profile. Uh, so just to talk a little bit more about the role of the local authority. Um, so as I mentioned, the statutory duty for local authorities to externally moderate the EYFSP in 25% of schools each year has been removed. Um, and we do hope that by removing that moderation, teachers and practitioners will be able to focus a lot more on teaching and not be spending lots and lots of time on unnecessary gathering of physical evidence and moderation. Despite that, there is still a duty on local authorities to collect EYFSP data um, at the end of reception year, and they do still need to submit that to the Department for Education. And the department will still publish that data annually. Um, including according to additional pupil characteristics. Um, LAs will also still have a key role in supporting early years providers and offering training to the providers who need it. Um, so as part of supporting local providers to deliver the reforms, we do think that LAs have a really big role to play in just helping to reduce that workload and helping providers to put their professional judgment and understanding of child development right back at the heart of early years assessment. Um, on the two-year-old progress check, so no changes have been made to this, um, and this does remain the only statutory assessment that people working with preception children will still need to carry out. Um, it's not a requirement to identify a child as exceeding, emerging or expected for the two-year-old check. Just wanted to talk a little bit about ongoing assessment within the Early Years Foundation stage. So again, kind of going beyond the statutory changes that we're bringing in through the reforms. Um, but we do want to be clear that for all practitioners throughout the EYFS, we want to shift the focus away from tracking and from evidence collection um, and lots and lots of data production and towards ongoing and formal assessment that's done through observation and interacting with the children and also through discussions with parents. So do you think this will help practitioners make informed decisions about what a child needs to learn? And just to determine the bigger picture of where that child needs to get to in the longer term, rather than planning lots and lots of multiple next steps. And for all practitioners, assessment shouldn't entail prolonged breaks away from interacting with children, and it shouldn't ever require excessive paperwork or gathering of evidence. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, so from September 2021, the requirement within the EYFS reform section three to promote the good health of children will also explicitly include oral health. Uh, so as I said before, it is completely up to providers to determine how they meet that new requirement in a way that works best for their setting. And we do recognise it will be different for different settings, depending on, on size, whether you're a childminder or a larger nursery. Um, we do think that it could include things like talking to children about the effects of eating too many sugary foods. Um, it could be talking to them about eating healthily or the importance of brushing their teeth. 
Uh, we do know that lots of local authorities do um, offer supervised toothbrushing programs, which is one option. Um, and we'd encourage you just to have a think about what will work best for you. So what do all of these changes mean for early years practitioners in practice? Um, so I've tried to summarise this in this slide. Uh, but first of all, uh, we think just see them as a good opportunity to refresh your curriculum and just ensure that it's really focusing on the things that you want your children to learn and how you're going to get them there. We want the reforms to lead to all practitioners, so not just reception teachers, um, spending less time tracking um, and less time gathering lots and lots of physical evidence. Um, to support assessments and less time on collecting frequent grabs of data. Uh, we think that taking part in valuable CPD activities will help all teachers and practitioners in implementing the reforms and just having that deeper knowledge of child development will really aid understanding of how to make holistic assessments on whether children are meeting expected levels of development and then just how to support their learning throughout the EYFS. We'd also encourage all of you to spend more time on professional conversations about children's development, as well as with parents, and to focus on that rather than the collection of physical evidence. Um, on this slide, we have some more quotes from our early adopter schools. And as you can see, again, we're having really positive feedback on the impact that the changes are having in their settings. So we do appreciate that you will be eager to understand what you need to do before September. Um, so to be clear that you don't need to make the changes now, uh, but you should start making plans to implement them from September 2021. Uh, so do take your time to read and familiarise yourself with the new EYFS framework um, and with the new development matters as well. If you're a nursery leader or a manager, you should design your curriculum around the new educational programmes um, and not focus on the early learning goals. Uh, it's really important that you speak to your staff members about these changes just to make sure that they're aware of them and how you see them affecting their roles and work and just support your staff to access the training professional development opportunities that they'll really need to implement the change as well. Uh, there's lots more materials available on foundation years and as I mentioned before uh, your local authority or other sector representative groups may also have information that they can share with you. If you're a nursery practitioner, you should speak to your manager or other leaders within your setting about how your work needs to adapt to the changes. And finally, if you're a childminder, again, you should start planning for the changes coming in from September um, and can find additional materials that'll be helpful on foundation years. Um, do look out for information from your local authority as they might be able to offer advice and support. Um, likewise, you can also seek advice from a professional association if you are a member of one. Um, and finally, you may wish to consider contacting other childminders in your area, uh, for example, by joining a childminder support group where you can share experiences of planning for the changes. So in terms of what you'll need to do from September 2021, so all early years providers will have to follow the new statutory framework. Um, and whatever your role and type of setting that you work in, you'll need to be working from that document. Um, so how and when your setting will be inspected by Ofsted will really depend on whether you're on the Child Care Register or the Early Years Register. But Ofsted will make sure that you're meeting the requirements for safety as well as for learning and development. If you don't meet the requirements, you'll be told what you need to do to improve and when you need to improve by. You can read Ofsted's inspection framework uh, to be aware of the processes and procedures, um, and that is under the education inspection framework on Ofsted's website. So we are working on online support materials that are specifically aimed at preperception settings, um, including childminders, which will offer further support to the sector with the upcoming changes. Uh, this will include suggestions of activities that you can undertake with children from similar settings and it will also include some short videos um, of practitioners as well. We're aiming to publish the resources in the summer term and we will be issuing some more information on that in due course. So this final slide just has some links to supporting guidance and materials that you might find useful in helping you to prepare for the changes. Um, a lot of these I have already mentioned during this presentation. Uh, we've included some links to some more school facing materials as well, but practitioners in pre-perception settings might find them useful to look at as well. 
Um, and throughout the summer term, we'll be publishing further guidance and support that will help you get ready for September. So do look out for those in due course. Uh, so thanks very much for listening to the DFE section of this podcast. Um, I hope it was useful in setting out the key changes coming into the EYFS, um, what they mean for you and where you can go for further information. Thank you, Anna. I'm now delighted to hand over to Phil Mins from Ofsted. My name is Phil Mins. I'm one of Her Majesty's inspectors and also the specialist advisor at Ofsted for early years and primary. And what I'm going to do is just take you through, uh, sort of for the next 15 minutes or so, some key messages from us um, that tie in with the reforms to the EYFS. Obviously, the um, the DFE and Ofsted are two separate entities, but there is um, there is some work that's crossed over, particularly around workload and some of the work that we've done in changing our inspection approach. Um, to address workload in the same way that DFE have um, identified and decided to address some workload issues. So hopefully that will come through in the presentation. So the first thing that I'm just going to start off talking to you about is a bit around data and workload and some of the decisions that we made when revising and updating our inspection approach that took those things into account, particularly um, when we're looking at younger children. Now our Chief Inspector, Amanda Spielman, um, revised our strategy when she started as the um, chief inspector and this is her um, strategy it's our, uh, the focus of our work now is very much more being a force for improvement through intelligent responsible and focused inspection and regulation um, the desire to be a force for improvement doesn't remove the fact that we inspect and we have to call things out if we think they need to change but the overarching purpose of our work should be to improve um, the quality and provision that children receive and so almost immediately after this um, change to our strategy we began to review the inspection frameworks and identified some sort of unintended consequences of the way that we were inspecting and some of that came down to data and the role that data was playing in education and sometimes um, the data and the accountability that came alongside it or the, the notion of accountability was actually taking people away from doing what we wanted them to do which was to teach children you know and get children to know more than they could before so we know in the early years that um, children are, are best when they've got high quality interactions from adults and sometimes the sort of the load if you like of assessment and the drive towards data was taking adults away from working directly with children and actually spending more time observing them and completing um, sheets and tick lists and things like that and so we wanted to remove anything from our inspection framework um, which would promote that or, or support it and there's a very clear message in our new inspection framework and when I say new it still feels new to me but that's because um, we introduced it in September 2019 and of course we only then used it for about six months before lockdown happened since when we haven't been inspecting so that new framework was very much um, aimed at reducing that workload and there's a clear message from us to all providers for early years which is don't do anything for Ofsted there is no requirement on you to do anything for us you shouldn't be thinking well Ofsted need that or Ofsted will want to see that what you need to be doing is the things for your children and what we'll be interested in is what you're doing for your children okay so worry about your children and we will come in and see what um you're doing and I know it's easy to say don't worry about Ofsted but what we're interested in is what you're doing with the children so um, that's the sort of bottom line so back to this slide this was the case for change around the inspection framework at the time what we realized was that sometimes children's learning was coming second to the assessment so rather than actually teaching the children new stuff or helping them to learn something new we were actually waiting to see whether they could do it or not and so we wanted if our um, in, inspection was influencing that we wanted to change it because what we know is that that narrows the curriculum and that when the curriculum is narrowed when it aims at a, a smaller range of things the children who are most badly affected are the disadvantaged and the least able now the narrowing the easiest way to think about narrowing the curriculum is when we look at um, older children because things are more straightforward as children get older so if we think about for example a French GCSE it might be that in a French GCSE there are seven areas of study and in the exam when you get to the GCSE exam that only three of those areas actually come up in the exam so what can happen sometimes is the curriculum is narrowed so actually children only learn those three subjects 
Um, and then they can still get the GCSE. It reduces the likelihood of them getting good GCSE, but they could still get the GCSE. And that hits the target, but misses the point. Because if the target is to get a GCSE, yes, that's okay. But actually the point of education is all of that knowledge that children need. And of course that child who's then got their French GCSE, as soon as they then go on holiday to France or decide to do French at A-level, they haven't got the knowledge they need. They haven't got that broad knowledge that they would have should have achieved by studying that for GCSE. Because tests only test a sample, they don't test the entire knowledge. Now we also see the impact of that in the early years. Sometimes the drive towards the EYFSP, that end of, a, of a EY assessment, narrows the curriculum for the children. And the way that that narrowing happens could be around some specific areas of learning where there's a pressure to deliver children to have certain levels in specific areas so that they can get um, a good level of development. And we would want everyone to have a good level of development, but we want it to, to have it because that's actually an indicator of the depth of their knowledge in all areas, not by narrowing towards parts and taking children away from some of the stuff that is going to hold them up later on. And I'm thinking particularly of prime areas of learning. Um, you know, when we look at children who struggle when they get into, for example, key stage two, into a junior um, part of the primary school, often it's things to do with their prime areas of learning if those aren't secure from the early years. So if they haven't got that broad vocabulary that they need, if they just don't know all of those concepts and words that they would get from that early learning, if they haven't got the personal, social, emotional development right um, then they're going to struggle so it's you know we have that hitting the target and missing the point can happen in the early is exactly the same as everywhere else and sometimes we those children move on without the stuff that they really need from the early years and those things around prime areas children really have to get in the early years because they, are, they exist within the curriculum in the early years they don't exist in the curriculum later on they're not able to give, be given the, the emphasis later on. And the early years is where those things are best taught and where it's where we've got the people who know about it best. So that's the focus on this, is moving away from that idea of um, the data driving things and actually much more about the real substance of education and what children are learning on a day-to-day -day basis. And just to back that up, really, when we're looking at our inspection and what we'll be looking at on inspection, this is an excerpt from the foundation stage. We inspect against it because it's the statutory requirement. And there it says assessment should not entail prolonged breaks from interaction with children. It shouldn't have excessive paperwork. You know, it's really important. Assessment is very important. And I'll talk to you a little bit about assessment in a moment. But that whole drive towards data, we have to question if that's actually doing the right thing for our children. Um, you know, what we do, like I said, um, you know, those high quality interactions with children is what helps them to learn. If we've got adults spending a lot of time doing things that are taking them away from that, those things have to be really valuable. And some of that data drive, I'm not sure that it's that valuable. Right, into the curriculum. We did a lot of work on the curriculum before we launched our new inspection framework because then we know the curriculum is where we will see the substance of education. There was some concern when we started doing the research into the curriculum that people thought we were going to come up with an Ofsted curriculum or what we expected to see. And that really wasn't the case. What we needed to do was determine what the curriculum was so we can see it when we're on inspection. Because everyone uses different words and different terminology to describe it, but we need to be able to find the curriculum and look at it in a, in a nursery setting, the same as we can do it in a further education place or a secondary school or a sixth form college. And so what we've come up with is our own definition of the curriculum, which is this very straightforward curriculum definition. The curriculum is simply the framework for setting out the aims of a program of education, and it includes the knowledge and the skills to be gained at each stage. It's actually setting it out. If you think about, you know, you've got your children, your children arrive with you and they can do some stuff. And by the time they leave you, you know, you want them to be able to do some more stuff. And there's a gap in between those two times and you're then pacing it out. You know, and you're making, working out how you can get them to where you need them to be by the time they finish from where they are when they start. That's a curriculum. Um, when we look at the early years, there's a, the, uh, the broad approach to the curriculum is laid out in the EYFS, in the educational programs, in those seven areas of learning. But 
um, even in the revised EYFS, they're still quite short. They are not, they don't contain sufficient information for you to know what you're doing on a sort of day-to-day, -day, week to week basis. And so that's why we've got in our, and this is a, um, an extract from our framework, it's the where we recognize that those educational pro programs provide the curriculum framework that leaders then build on to decide what they intend children to learn and develop. So one way of looking at it is to say that the EYFS provides the skeleton of the curriculum, but it's up to you to put the meat on the bones based on what you know about your children and how you know they, um, you know, the progress that they're going to make, the progression they're going to need to make, you do that and sort that out. And from our point of view, that's where the New Development Matters document comes in. Um, it, it is not a statutory document, so we will not be inspecting against it and we won't be expecting everyone to be using it. But what we do anticipate is that everyone has to go through that process of taking those big educational programs and turning them into something that you can deliver, um, you know, and adding that, that detail and the meat on those bones. So we anticipate that people will use development matters or something like it. Um, you, people might be choosing to do that themselves or be, you know, getting, finding something else to use. But whatever it is, what we need to make sure when we're inspecting, we'll be making sure that the whatever, the, whatever way you do that delivers the requirements of the early years foundation stage and meets the needs of the children in your setting. But one way of looking at the um, curriculum is, and the way that we would see it, is as a progression model. So the curriculum, like I said, sets out the steps, the pathway for children to get from where they are to where you want them to be. And the, you know, clear, good, strong curriculums do that thinking before the children are there. We're not sort of making it up whilst we're going along. We've actually thought about it. And um, I, I'll give you a quick example, which is nothing to do with, um, with the curriculum, really. It's just trying to choose a simplified example to show you what I mean by a curriculum being a progression model. And I'm going to talk to you about bicycles. So imagine that all we had to do was get children to ride bikes, how easy our life might be. Um, so I, I'm going to give you a, a progression model. I want you to imagine that we're in a very large sports hall. We're all looking at a wall. And in the left hand corner of that wall, there is a bike appropriate for a two year old. OK, probably um, let's have a balance bike, one of those nice wooden ones with big rubber wheels. And then in the right hand corner at the other end of this long wall, we've got a bike that's appropriate for a 16 year old. Um, it might be something off roady, it could be a, a road bike, you know, one of those lightweight things with about 40 gears, something where you probably have to wear Lycra to actually get onto it. So we've got those two bikes, those are the extremes, you know, the two year old is where they're starting, the 16 year old is where they're finishing, and then we've got all the bikes in the middle, a bit like Halfords at Christmas. We've got those bikes, they'll be increasing in size and complexity. As, the, as we go from the one for the two-year-old up to the 16-year-old. You can imagine at some point we'll probably have stabilizers attached to some bikes where we move from three wheels to two wheels. There'll be gears on some bikes, but they probably won't come right at the beginning. They'll be in the middle somewhere. And we'll probably just start with three gears. We won't go straight to 21. That will come later on. So you imagine that's our progression model. And we've got those bikes and we know that if, before any child arrives in this place, for most children, the vast majority of children, apart from those with special needs or disabilities that might stop them from being able to do it, for the vast majority of children, if we give them that bike when they're two and we give them the support and the practice and the time they need, they will be riding that bike when they're 16. That's, we've done that thinking. That's a progression model. The advantage of doing that thinking beforehand is if you are the person who then, if you're the adult who has to work with the children and get them on that balance bike when they're two, and you know where they're going next. You know that next year they're actually going to start pedaling, let's say. Then you know what you've got to get those children to do. You know where they've got to get to by the end. You know that actually what you want them to do is be confident, be steering, be balanced, and be able to avoid other people, avoid the crashes. You know, these are the things that we're going to want them to do. We can have them all doing it. And whilst they're doing it, we can see how well they're progressing. We can see the ones who've got it really great let's give them some more chance to practice we can see the ones who are hesitant we can see the ones who need an extra bit of help we can see the ones who might need to do it on their own when there's no one else around and we can also see the ones when we're in that setting who probably aren't choosing to get on the bikes and so let's go and help them let's go and encourage them let's take that time to work with them 
So by sorting out what we want them to learn, and that's what we've done with those bikes, that's what we want them to learn is that bike. We can then focus on how we get them to learn it, how we engage them with it. That's the real, that's the real, um, the, you know, the trick of teaching, isn't it? For all of us is to, to know what we want the children to learn and then to find a good way of engaging the children in that learning and getting them where we want them to be. So by setting it out beforehand, we make life a bit easier for the people who are actually on the ground doing the teaching because they know what they've got to get those children to get. Um, now, this last thing, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about sensible assessment. Now, sensible assessment is not an official term from Ofsted. I've said that myself. This is me. Because assessment should be sensible. It shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't take over our lives. It needs to be sensible and thought out. And I would argue that actually the best and most useful assessment is actually going back to my bikes when you're stood there watching those children. That's it. It's actually the active engagement of the adult with the child and what they've got to learn. Do they need a bit of extra help? Do I need to get them back in here? What is it that's still causing the problem? Why aren't they getting on the bike? You know, is it because that's, you know, why are they falling off the bike? Is it because they're so busy talking to somebody else when they're on the bike that they're not paying attention? Um, but whatever it is, that's the actual, you know, assessment is about engaging in that way. So that's really important because what we need is for our children to be expert. They need to be expert in whatever they're learning. And when we say expert, that means they've got to have these really deep, deep knowledge in their long term memory. Now, when we talk about knowledge, we do not mean dusty facts that you get from a book. We don't mean, you know, that sort of, you know, the, the seven reasons behind the First World War. Knowledge is simply a piece of information that you need to know to be able to do something. So there's knowledge associated with riding a bike. Um, you know, there's the knowledge of how to steer, there's the knowledge of the direction you're going in, there's the knowledge of balance. All of these things are bits of knowledge. And if we can get them really deeply stored in long term memory, then children really know it. They're really confident because they're really secure in what they know. They can do it really, really well. That's what we need all of our children to get before they move on to the next stage. Um, descriptors and mark schemes do not replace a curriculum. So, for example, the, the goals, the early learning goals are not a curriculum um, and that we shouldn't pretend that they are. We shouldn't be working backwards from the goals. What we should be doing is looking at the requirements and teaching it. And then the goals, when those assessments are made, are a health check. They test part of it. You know, and we can see that in the maths. You know, the maths goals do not include shape, space and measure. That doesn't matter to us in Ofsted at all, because we know that um, what we're interested in seeing is children making that progress. So that's what we're looking for. And the progress then comes in these sort of small steps. So the composite activity, the complicated activity, which here I put as singing a large number of songs. If we do assessment that tells us whether they can do it or not, it doesn't help us. It's like getting everyone to run a race. We know who's won and we know who's lost, but that doesn't actually help us get anybody to improve. Um, Whereas what, if we look at the components that they need to be able to do this task, that does help us. So we look at the components and here I've put four different components down that might be part of this child's ability to sing a large number of songs. If we know that they can pronounce words correctly and we know they understand a growing range of vocabulary and we know they're confident in a range of situations, then we start to realize that actually it's the movements that's getting in the way for them. You know, what is probably happening for this child who can't sing a large number of songs is because they can't do the actions at the same time. So they're spending so long thinking about the actions they can't sing the song. Now, if we know that it's the actions that are causing the problem, we can do something about it. We can help them. We can focus on it. We can, you know, we can all, whoever's working with them can make sure that we work on that bit. And then we get them so they can sing a large number of songs. If all we think of is they can't sing a large number of songs, so let's just keep making them do it. Let's make them do those large number of songs more and more frequently. Actually, what's probably going to happen is they're just going to like it less. Any pleasure they had out of singing is going to disappear because it's just constantly reminding them of something they can't do. As soon as we identify these component parts, and if that's where our assessment sits, that's much more helpful because it means that when we're then doing those teaching activities, we know what bits of gold we want left at the end of the session. And that's what's so important. What are the golden nuggets? Those things that's really important for the, the child to learn. And if we can focus on those bits, then actually we take that child forward much more quickly. So the assessment should be identifying 
the reasons why they find some things difficult. And then when we're teaching, we can focus on those and help those children to make progress. Now, my last slide here is just one. I've just taken some pieces out of the handbook um, just to show you that the curriculum features really, really heavily in it and appears everywhere. And if you haven't read it, I would suggest you do because it's um, it'll set it all out for you and hopefully make sense. Thank you, Phil. I'm now delighted to hand over to my colleague, Jill, who has interviewed Vicky, a nursery teacher in an early adopter setting, about her experiences of the early adopter year. So I'm Jill Holden. I'm the Principal Officer of the Early Childhood Unit here at the National Children's Bureau. And I'm really pleased that Vicky has joined us today um, to talk about uh, early adoption um, in pre-reception. So, um, Vicky, would you like to introduce yourself for us? Yeah, hi, I'm Vicky. Um, and I work at uh, the Northumberland Church of England Academy um, and I'm one of the nursery teachers. Brilliant. Thanks, Vicky. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Really appreciate how, uh, how massively busy it is uh, for you at the moment. So really do appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. So as an early adopter, um, can you just tell us a little bit about what the main changes um, you have made this year in nursery have been? Yeah, I, th I think we, we sort of started off um, looking at um, the curriculum um, and thinking about um, you know, what we do now and, and, uh, and also what works well at the moment and sort of started from that point of view and then to see, you know, you know what, what, what our tech children need um, at the school um, and what our sort of community needs as well. So it was, it was a good point to start off from really, you know, just looking at what we do now, what works well, and then how can we sort of put that in place in the future. And I think one of the good things that has been, it's been sort of that, that time to reflect on you know what like I say what you know what does work well and also to sort of involve the whole team you know it means that we've had those conversations as to you know why are we doing these things what are we doing them for um, we've also got two-year-old provision at our school and obviously going on to reception so you know that sort of flow through of, of you know how it how it sort of leads on from you know from from the two-year-olds through to nursery through to reception um, and and sort of giving us a, a more sort of um, overall picture of of what the child child needs in our sort of in our setting, um, and just thinking about you know for a child coming in, what would it look like to them? You know what was what what's our offer really? Um, and it's just made us have loads of those conversations, and I think that's been a useful time because you tend to tend to go along and do you know the usual thing because we've done that before. You know, so it's been a good time to reflect. That's great, thank you. I think that's a really important point as well, having that, that stop chance to just gather your thoughts and, and look at where you're from. So that's brilliant, thank you. So can you just tell me a little bit about what the key difference is that you've made? Um, yeah, well, because of the, of the area we we're in, it's quite a disadvantaged area. So we've already, always had a big focus on communication and language. Um, and I think that that's been, um, you know, a, a, a really big thing this year because, um, you know, it runs right through the document um, and it, it, it's, we're, we're really delighted to see that really, that kind of that sort of, you know, enabled us to sort of make that a real focus. Um, right the way through um, and that focus on stories and story language as well you know so they've got kind of something to sort of you know hook it hook it onto and it's sort of a bit of, of an interest there um, and, and also the other one um, that really stands out is the the maths because um, because sort of kind of reducing the maths down you know to sort of work in those numbers one to five rather than having to think right we've got to go for the bigger numbers we've got to push them further really sort of spending that time with those sort of individuals to get to grips with with their math skills and, and not just sort of recognizing numbers but really sort of going deeper you know sort of you know the supertizing you know sort of the you know the thinking of you know what comes before what comes after um, and I think it's kind of allowed us almost to do that, you know, rather than thinking we've got to move on, move on, move on, um, just to sort of, you know, just to sort of take that pace down or, and, and really just sort of just go to, to the depth rather than the, you know, the breadth, I suppose, with it. Um, yeah, those skills, I suppose, is developing the skills. That's really great. Thank you. Um, so, as you know, one of the aims of the reforms um, was about reducing paperwork. Have you found this to be the case for you? Um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's enabled us to have more sort of purposeful time with the children. I think as a nursery teacher, you kind of, um, you know, 
almost as a child walks through the door, you know, you've got that gut feeling of how, how, how they are and what sort of their levels and abilities are. And I think, you know, that that needs to be, um, you know, valid and justified. And I think now it is, I think, you know, it's not having to, you know, do a ticky sheet or do, you know, record every little thing. Um, and I think it's sort of that real sort of focus, you know, on the individuals um, and that, you know, it's sort of a trusted, you know, judgment. Um, we still do things like tapestry, um, but we find that that's a really good way of sort of communicating with parents um, and, you know, sort of getting their views and seeing what the things they do at home. Um, and the other thing we do still is um, sort of floor books. So, you know, we, we do uh, um, put photographs in of things they've done or children's work. But again, it's, it's more the reason why we're doing that is more of a communication so um, tool for the children so they can kind of reflect on their learning. It's not sort of for, you know, a specific purpose. It's, it's more for the children. Um, and we find that that's, that's sort of working well at the moment. Great, thank you. So thinking about that as well, has your method of assessment changed? Yes, um, we, we're just now um, just doing an on-entry assessment and, um, and, a, and a, uh, an exit ex assessment. So um, that, um, you know, I mean, the exit assessment really is, is kind of a transition. So it's that, um, that discussion with the reception teacher of, of, of individual progress, where they are and, um, you know, sort of, you know, what they need to do next. But we've also really simplified it down now. They've not got all the age bands we've just gone for on track or below. Um, and it, it's kind of made us really think about those children that are below, what do they need? Um, and I suppose it's kind of made us sort of think it's more of um, like a, a, a focus for them as to, you know, the starting points of where they need to go. So we would continue to look at those children right through the year and see if they're still on track, but it, it's not like a data capture or like a, you know, a, a, a formal assessment. It's more sort of, kind of what you would do anyway with your conversation with your, you know, your TA and that sort of, you know, the conversation you have with yourself almost, you know, that sort of, you know, um, uh, and, and I think because it's simplified, you, you know in your head straight away, those children are below, this, this, this group needs to do kind of the next step. Um, and I think that that sort of made it um, easier for us in that sense um, and made it more relevant and helped us to plan. Brilliant. That's really, really helpful, um, Vicky. Thank you so much indeed. So just before we finish, um, if I could ask you, if you had one piece of advice uh, for the nursery teachers out there who are preparing to, um, to use the reforms from September, what would that one piece of advice be? Um, I think it's um, really to have a really sound knowledge of child, child development. Um, I think once you know that and you kind of know um you know those children if they're on track and um you know what sort of levels they should be it sort of it's if you've got a good understanding of that then that's going to be really helpful um and it, so and to enjoy the journey i think with them you know that enjoy the children enjoy the journey um and and i think you can be that part of their journey much more now and i think that that's that's really nice so yeah child development and um you know and uh, you know why we're all here really to, to spend time with the children and enjoy it. Brilliant, thank you so much. And that's so lovely. I think you're absolutely spot on about that, the why we're all here and it's about the children. So thank you so much um, for taking this time out of your really busy day to come and talk to me today, Vicky. Really, really appreciate it. Well, thanks to Anna, Phil, Vicky and Dr. Julian Gronier for their time on this podcast today. And thank you to the Foundation Years community for watching. We hope you found this useful. Bye.